here to Siegel Talks at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Greta Center CUNY in New York City at City University. And it's uh, another day again on planet Earth and uh, it's a bit cloudy today in New York and the outlook still is very, very grim. Um, we have over 4 million confirmed infections. The time says it's 13 to 14 times higher. So most of there are 40, 50 million people um, with the virus at the moment. Uh, it's a catastrophe in New York, a million jobs lost, still everything closed. Uh, when it comes to theater and the arts, people out of jobs, uh, musicians, uh, technicians, light people, dramaturgs, and there's no help. Uh, that little unemployment help that the government has put out for a lot of people might run out in 10 days. Um, the memorandum on eviction might run out in 10 days, so people will lose their homes. The insurance, it's uh, going to be a disaster at August. Uh, heats are rising, and, uh, and we are really experiencing in the moment where uh, we do not really know where we are in, except that we know we are in a catastrophe movie which we haven't seen and we don't know how it will end. Or as someone from Spider Women Theater said, uh, because this is a creational myth and we are in and uh, hopefully we make the right decision of Bruno Latour who said, this is the general rehearsal. More will come with climate change and other stuff. If we screw this up, we are lost. So we have to use this opportunity. And we at the Siegel always believe that we need to listen to artists, not only if it comes to the field of art and theater, but also in general, artists on the right side of justice, the right side of progressive justice, of the complex uh, struggle for freedom and liberties. And we really should listen to them and their insights are of significance and they anticipate the future and they really are in the present. As Jacques Concierge, the great French philosopher said, who actually will join us next Monday. Um, so well, with us uh, today, we have uh, two workers um, in the vineyard um, of theater and uh, great ones, uh, significant ones, people who, um, as I say, they are organically politically in their work. And we will talk about this. First of all, I want to say hi to Adelheid Rosen from Amsterdam. Adelheid, thank you for joining. Hello, Frank. And I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, and below there on the screen, this is Melanie Joseph, the great Melanie from the Foundry Theater. So let me tell you a few things about Adelheid before we start. He's uh, a, a Dutch theater practitioner, actor, drama teacher, and a writer. And in her theater and film production, she engages with controversial subjects as honor killings, domestic violence, sexuality in Islamic cultures, and her mother's Alzheimer's disease. And uh, she has been writing a trilogy and directing of Muslim immigrants. And she created a method in which theater practitioners are adapted by local residents, some kind of uh, radical hosting or radical <laughs> listening we say, in a way. And I think it's a great idea. And people are, have took notice of that. She also got from the League of uh, Professional Women in Theater, the international award, a very big award given out every four years, I think, or five. and. Um, and so this is a very big, uh, very big deal. And uh, she also was named uh, this year, Harper's Bazaar's Women of the Year Audience Award, which is a super big deal stuff um, that uh, does not happen normally for people who do such work in the theater world. So can you imagine how good it must be um, to, to, to get something? And with us, the great Melanie Joseph, for all of those who do not know, but we do have international listeners. Um, she's a theater maker and the founding artistic producer of the Foundry Theater. And for over 25 years, she has made groundbreaking, significant work, socially engaged uh, art uh, for what she did here. Um, and she's the editor and contributing writer to a moment of the clock of the world, where she looked back in the work of the Foundry Theater, a fantastic book by Haymarket. So please do look it up if you want to know what theater can do in, in the city, how it can create for a community and she got many awards, the Doris Duke Artist Prize, the Lotel Award, a Skirball Artist Prize. And she has been honored with two Obies. I am already one is a big deal, but two is a, a something of real significance. And she really is at the forefront and always has been um, of contemporary theater here in New York and in America and therefore of the world. So uh, Adelheid and Melanie, excuse me for, um, for, for, for the long introduction, as I always say, it's all we say, it's all about listening. And then I talk and talk. My name, by the way, is Frank, Frank Enchka from the Seagull. Um, so Adelheid, um, would be tough to know where you are. It looks like a New York apartment, but where are you and what time is it? 
I'm in my atelier in, uh, in the center of Amsterdam and it's uh, six o'clock, five minutes more. Oh my five goodness. minutes after six o'clock in the afternoon. After six o'clock. So um, um, what neighborhood is it? And so you have an apartment and an atelier, is it connected or? Um... No, the, the atelier is next to my office. It's over there. Uh -huh. I'm artistic leader of a theater company and the theater company is um, mostly women for 95%. <laughs> and uh, women from all different uh, cultures and backgrounds. A lot also from Muslim uh, countries. But tell us a bit about your theater company. Mm. Well, first, I'm very grateful to be their artistic leader. I, I tell them that I think weekly, <laughs> on a weekly basis, <laughs> because uh, I think to be an artistic leader is a, is a huge joy because you, you can analyze yourself a lot. You get a lot of gifts by looking the other artists in the eyes and see if you were rude or wrong or too quick or um, uh, not patient. And the feedback of that is you learn so much because leading is a beautiful thing, uh, a beautiful thing to learn, I think. It's, it's, it's amazing to, yeah, to really find out to, in the end, so that you can really lead with your heart, not with your ego, but really with your heart, so that you can find the artistic choices uh, like in the spontaneity of your first thought. So they remember me. So, so they, re yeah, they remember me a lot about the first light. They remind you. Re remind me, right. Yeah. And yeah, right, that's it, Melanie. Good, yeah. yeah. So I think you've done it for over 30 years. What, how, did, how did it happen? What, where were you when the corona crisis hit? Did it, how was that in Amsterdam and in Holland? How was the experience? <laughs> this is a good story. <laughs> well, we were happily, we were, we were uh, actually uh, like nervously laughing because the evening before our prime minister said on television, we have a lockdown, we have an, uh, we, in Holland it's called an intelligent lockdown. So also you have like a, an own responsibility. So if you have to go somewhere, you can go somewhere. So, so that is a nice uh, space actually. And the evening before I was rehearsing for a huge performance I was going to make in December in the main hall theater. It's called the Doulas of the city of Amsterdam. It's a bit like, you know, it's, a, yeah, I brought some, So we were laying with uh, 40 women like this, which was that we were rehearsing what I call a women line. And, and that is what we did with 40 people embracing each other and with the choreographer, uh, Amy O'Grego. So we were through the rehearsing space and the hand over here and the hand here and the hand here and embracing each other. And the next morning it was like lockdown. Nobody got ill happily. But that, that was so strange. Mm. So we, we were from the embrace to distance. <laughs> this is a radical... Uh radical change. Um, so how severe was the lockdown and how long did it last? Uh, March, April, May, the 1st of June, uh, we uh, 30 people could enter 
theater spaces. And the 1st of July, 100 people could enter theater spaces, but still with one and a half meter distance. So you did shows? You already presented work? No. No. No, I was teaching at, uh, on the theater school, on the actor school. And the school had very, very almost cruel rules for the, for the students. Uh, happily, I had in, or we had enormous good weather, but I got my class 20 students and the school said, well, here they are. And I was outside. We couldn't enter the building. So because the weather was so beautiful, I teach on the, on the museum square uh, where there's grass, trees, so we had shadow. So I worked outside. For a month then? Or For two weeks. For two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> and after that it started <laughs> raining. <laughs> Uh, uh, wow, Melanie, um, and when you I want to add, I want to uh, add something, Frank, to your question is that the piece that Adelheid was is working on that was supposed to go up in December no longer can has 80 people in it. So since there's only 100 people allowed in the theater, <laughs> and she already had 80 people before any lights or any, you know what I mean? So incredible, just and the measure 80, 80 performers on a but uh, Melanie, when when, when uh, you, you heard or we were you know communicating about many other things, you've been such a great supporter of our series, made many great suggestions. How great was the Carl Hancock Rux talk? I don't know if you had, had time. I to didn't get to listen because I had another oh, Zoom that was call. So significant. But it's but I will of course I heard I heard it was fantastic. Yeah. I've, yeah, yeah. So when you heard about Adelheid, you said, yes, I'd love to. I actually, you said, we had another possibility. He says, no, I want to be with Adelheid. What do you think about her? How do you, how do you both connect? You mean, uh, well, first I think that both of us um, owe a great debt to Gideon Lester. <laughs> yeah, um, we do. We love him and especially because he brought us together. Yeah. And, and he nagged both of us to meet and both of us were kind of like, uh, you no, know, you were, no, you were, I wasn't. Okay, because <laughs> I, I always, okay, fair enough, fair enough. I, all, you know, always someone is saying, oh, you have to meet so-and-so, you have to meet so-and-so. And sometimes, I, you know, it's a lot. And I'm always a bit nervous because I don't know what the expectation is. So I went. And um, we both sat there opposite with Gideon and we were both kind of quiet. I thought you too, because you were quiet in the beginning. You didn't know what to say. So then Gideon asked us a question, asked Adelheid to talk about her work in a similar way as you are right now. And so she began to talk about the things that she was doing. And I'm like, oh, okay, wait a minute. I, I recognize this, and but of course, I'm always nervous that somebody's doing it disrespectfully because it's a very delicate, nuanced approach when you're working with community, when you're working with communities. And, um, and there's so much care that's required and there's so much, um, so many stairs, uh, so many steps to understand, let alone take in terms of the delicacy of these developments. And yeah. so I would interrupt her and ask her some question. Oh, you did that? Did you do this? And she was like, not only had she done the thing that I thought was important, but she had another idea about how to do it, which was fantastic. So it was like this kind of, I could feel my whole body moving forward and forward. And I think Adelheid, if I'm correct, by the end, we were laughing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure we laugh a lot, mm, she and I. It's important to have a, a joy in the work. And Betty Shamia said yesterday, but um, maybe Adelheid, tell us a bit, and you jump in whenever you, you can, this idea of the, not politics, but the political, the idea of community and, and that method as you kind of develop. Tell us a bit and share it because we're all looking for forms. How can theater be of 
of, of use, how can it be meaningful? And everybody now really, for good reasons, we need to connect to communities, something you have done and you have spirit. If you could tell us a little bit what you do and what you learned. And why. And why. I think why is also really important. Like, what is your mission? Well, let's say, I went to art school. I was raised what I call uh, by my mother, uh, what I call in a military regime. Um, I had no fantasy of if I ever could escape that. I called it a jail. Uh, I was used to it, so I, I didn't know the difference. I only felt it sometimes when I visited friends. Uh, but I never thought I would end up in art school. There was a teacher on high school uh, who I'm grateful to until this day, who knocked on the door of my parents, parents one night. And of course, I couldn't hear it. Uh, but uh, a week later, he called me um, after school and gave me some flyer material of art schools and dance schools. And well, um, I think I threw them away like I can never take this home. And uh, after my high school, but it was a light. After my high school, I, I started to study French because my mother still um, had me, let's say, in her control. And when I went to the, when I started to be a student, then uh, I, I was on my bike every day to the university uh, and I saw the art school. So the second light was that I thought, well, maybe, maybe I can enter. And well, and so step by step, I did auditions and um, uh, I was accepted. I didn't tell my parents. So the first year I was hiding it. It was like a secret. And when I entered the high school, it was like the jail broke open. Uh, so I was not educated with artists. I was not educated with examples. Um, I had my curiosity and I felt like a playing child. I couldn't believe, I really couldn't believe that you could play with everything in classrooms. That uh, teachers were like, uh, having a dialogue with you, we're, we're asking how you feel. I mean, like how you feel, how your, how is your heart? How is your, what do you need? Uh, you know, like, do you need space and time and an embrace? I, I couldn't believe it. So the four years in, in our school were for me like, yeah, really heaven. And um, I think from how I, how I was raised, and that is still what I do in my work now, I see the whole world actually as a quite small place. I, 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 I know it's huge, but it's like all the people in the world uh, fit for me on what I call uh, a schoolyard. And everybody for me has to be on that schoolyard. That is what is so important for me. That's like a, a, a daily fight. Everybody, every human being belongs on the schoolyard. And of course, then you can on the schoolyard disagree or whatever you, you know, you make groups or you make churches or you have different cultures or different languages or whatever you do, but there's one schoolyard. So completely unconsciously, I started to look for people who were pushed away. Minor groups, 
or also or, or bigger groups, but um, when people were looked at like you are you you do not really belong here, in my opinion. Uh, you don't have the right religion or education or uh, look like or body or whatever. And that was my constant inspiration of like, really? There's a human being who doesn't belong on our schoolyard? So, and, and there started my creation. So every time I brought people together, even, yeah, well, the, for example, that's also how I came to the Honor Revenge. I interviewed uh, 10 men who killed a daughter, a niece, or a daughter of the neighbors. Uh, and uh, the delicate thing about that is that a lot of journalists in the country, so you have to very, you have to be very strong in those interviews and also on television, because the first question they 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 ask you is like, oh, okay, so Adelheid, you understand the killers, and you understand or support. Yeah, 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 right. It, 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 You're yeah. on the side of the killers. Well, that is what they try to, to put in your mouth. Yes. And what I wanted to do, of course, is to know their, their life story, how they became the, kill, the killer of, for example, their sister. So I wanted to look in the eyes of those men and ask them like, do you think you were born to be the killer of your sister? And so I wrote a piece about, I wrote a piece about it and I directed a piece about that uh, to, to put the two stories on the line. So my heart, my heart is always, uh, it's like, it's, it's like, and it's even, I'm even not, uh, it's, it's, it's not, my heart is not disappointed or my heart is not frustrated. It's every time it's like, it's passionate and also like with, and, and also naive and also with that surprising, uh, curious question, like, are you serious? You know, is there a human being? who's not allowed on the schoolyard, but we have only one schoolyard. So that's always the start of my... You know, Adelheid, there's a practice, I'm sure it's there too, but here that's grown up through the social justice movements called um, transformative justice. It's an alternative um, approach to, to the people who have been people who have committed crimes and the people upon whom the crimes have been committed. And um, there's an organization in the, in the Bay Area, I think it's called 5G, Five Generations, that was formed by a group of people who had been sexually abused as children. And they formed 5G to address the pedophiles, not as monsters. Like, how do we deal with these, these people exist? It's not like they were looking for a way to permit that kind of um, crime at all, but to, but to kill them, to lock them away, to, to ignore them in a certain way in the, in, in the transformative justice process, you're just, it's just going to be a constant cycle of, you know, crime, lock up, throw away the key, next one, a child is, you know, so it's interesting to me that within a theatrical, within your curiosity, which again, I think these are organic questions. Yeah. Because those people, those, how do you, you know, how do you, open your heart to hear the process of that 
do you feel like your piece was able to contain what you received, the size of what you received? Yeah, I had one, it started, it came there. And that was, uh, that made me very happy. It started, I had a, I was guest in a talk show on television. And for example, they added uh, a woman who was from a right wing party um, uh, who worked on the Department of uh, Refugees and Asylum. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know she was a guest. Oh my God. Oh, oh, my yeah. oh my god oh my god yeah that was so, so and she of course wanted um all the migrants from muslim countries and they you know that whole polarization and to put the shadow on what we call the the new dutch people actually and I was, whoa, I had to stay so quiet inside and so connected to my heart and only tell her all the time, this is wrong what you are doing. Uh, you are using this piece, um, how do you say that, to manipulate. Uh, your piece? You were, yeah. She was using your piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had she, had, did she see it? No. Of course not. Of course not. No, she was really using it. So I thought, oh, I have to discipline myself and not go in the debate. And, you know, because it, of course, television, it was like, you know, the talk show of the day at eight o'clock. So I thought like, oh man, I have to protect the Muslim community. And, and I had to repeat every time only the sentence in my heart, you know, the beauty of being with them, the beauty of living with them, the beauty of that they were opening up their life story in jail, the beauty of the Ministry of Justice to let me in, the beauty of the families, the families who let me in their houses and were more, and so that, that I could mourn with their, you know, their their daughters who were dead and i i you know i i stick to that path of walking through that interview but i was like afterwards i was like i had like i was knocked out how were the reactions of the audiences in amsterdam to the work oh yeah that was beautiful that was beautiful that was beautiful That was beautiful. The, the, we went also with, um, with the piece to New York. We played it in um, St. Anne's. In St. Anne's. And there happened something very, very, very sad thing. Because um, the, mic, the microphone of Youssef, and that was really the, how do you say, the, 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 the hat actor? The, 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 central, the central character. Yeah, the central character. And it broke three times behind each other. And then he walked off the stage. And he committed suicide uh, one year later. He jumped off the building of the theater school. Yeah, it was so, when you, it was so sad. It was so sad. And it was so amazing that he, that he took this part, that he, he wanted so, he was so passionate to play that part. And after New York, we went to Jordan to play it on a festival in Jordan, in Amman. Uh, and that was actually very brave of that festival in Amman, because in Jordan, you have the highest numbers of honor killings. So that was like, wow, and we played it three times. 
and then Yusuf was so soft and elegant and he played it so firmly and then a psychiatrist who is related to killing, to, to, to how do you say it, what was it, suicide, that he explained later to me and the family that, that actually after a depression, that actually when you become very smooth and vital and vibrant, that you already took the decision of the suicide in your... Mm. I'm incredible what an um, what a deep deep engagement in people's lives and uh, in themes that are so so essential heartbreaking T tell us a bit how do you connect to the community normally a theater traditionally you are as a building and they put up flyers and buy ads on Facebook and as they come to us and pay money and you're an audience member I looked at ticket ticket buyer what what do you do what do you think of your community and how do you connect to them To the communities I work with, you mean? Where you are centered in, yeah, for where your theater is, but also the communities you work with. How do you work with the community? How do you do that? Um, <laughs> Many different ways. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah. have Adelheid here. What's your so? <laughs> um, How about it goes this way? How about what? May I, Frank? Sure. That's such a broad question. It, May I ask, because I would like to know, what is it the idea of the piece first or the community first? What makes you want to make a piece with X community? Even talk about the 80 person piece, for example. Why did you want to make that piece? Tell what that piece is and why you wanted to make it. And then how do you contact those people? Maybe it's that uh, light I was talking about. For me, the, 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 the community feels like can be everywhere in Holland, can be in, in every city, in every district or neighborhood, in every street, in every house. In, um, but you identify specific communities for specific pieces. I don't mean they all live here or they all look the same, but for example, you made a piece about honor killing. So of course you're going to be connected to the Muslim community. You made the, uh, you're making this doula piece. So you're, commu so you're communicating with all these doulas all over the, so that's a community of people. What comes first, the idea or knowing the community and then wanting to make that piece? The, when my heart, when my heart is calling, it's something on the bike, or when I do the dishes, or under the shower. It's it feels very natural. It's like uh, it's not something I choose. It's something which is there. Okay, and it identifies the community that you're going to reach out to. Sometimes I know the community, sometimes I don't. Sometimes it's, uh, I've read it in the newspaper. Okay. Something, sometimes it's, I'm, I'm getting angry or like, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah. You know, and then I remember the name or I write down the name and I start looking for the name and. Um, oh, so it does start with you each time. I'm not, uh, I'm just double checking this. Okay, so then how do you reach out from there? What is the process of reaching out to strange people you've never met before? 
I jump on my bike or I take uh, the, the, the subway or the tram. And uh, what, what Frank already mentioned in the beginning, uh, the adoption, that is the adoption method is something I do that now for 15 years, I think. So I, 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 I really, I, I park my bike and, I, and I'm shy. And I learn all my actors to stay connected to that shy feeling and not walk over that. Not building an imago, not building yourself, but be as vulnerable as you are. That's part of the method. Be as shy as you are, be as stuttering as you are. And really, um, and, and then ring a bell and ask for a tea if you can come in and sit on the couch and share your life story and then ask if you can stay and overnight. <laughs> Frank, isn't that amazing? That is amazing. That's a community outreach, yes. <laughs> right, like that's what you call outreach. I mean, when we did, when we did, um, open house which was the show that we had to do in people's living rooms right 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 like you have to ask there's so many stages to it you know what i mean like you're gonna be rehearsing in their house you're going to ask them to participate in aaron's piece we ask them to participate in the show yeah. you have to make site visits to the we made we have to make site visits to the living rooms to see if actually we can do it there like <laughs> the interaction was so amazing actually yeah it's so beautiful isn't it it's so beautiful oh, i mean we didn't sleep over i wish we had but this is new york i'm not sure i don't know frank i i i, I, it's, different, I yeah. it's a little bit different here but or it's a lot different from Amsterdam. That said, it's still a huge request to us to sleep there, but it's also a huge request to say, we want to make our show in your living room and we want you to be in it. Yeah, yeah. But that is what we share, no? Yes. That is what we have together and that is what we didn't know and that fabulous Gideon knew. Yes, yes, yes. Because I never, I, I never met on this planet somebody who did that. Well, <laughs> it was really, I wish that my colleagues that were part of it with me were sitting here right now because we met some extraordinary people. Oh my God. Sundar, one, I was working then with Sundar Ganglani and he met this woman who was a near, I think she was a near Eastern archeologist. And she lived in an apartment on Fifth Avenue with her husband on Fifth Avenue. I'd never been in an apartment on Fifth Avenue. It was my first time ever. And, um, and her, she was brilliant and inquisitive and, oh my God, she was amazing. And that was the apartment we let the New York Times come to review the show in her apartment. Like that was the other thing, like, <laughs> Anyway, I mean, we did the show in their homes. I mean, I think you should talk a little bit more about this adoption process because it's a much longer engagement for the actors. And then what happened after? I don't, it's important for people to know that it's a very, we have very different practices of what we do that is the same. So maybe talk a little about what the adoption is and then the piece that grows out of it. The first one. Yeah, I start, for example, the, the last uh, I did um, of this piece, well, I, I first made this piece for the first time and I didn't know I would, let's say, repeat it. But then what you can call the structure of it or the blue print of it. Um, but take us to the first one. Um, it, What was the piece about that you ultimately made? Okay, it, it started um, also by, um, you know, uh, what you just asked me and what Frank 
asked me to. Like I read something about the neighborhoods and the districts. And I thought, okay, when the Queen of Holland or the mayor of Amsterdam is receiving international guests, they go every time uh, to, let's say, um, four or five uh, places in the city who are beautiful, museum, uh, canal boats, or, you know, or, and I thought, and why never to a neighborhood in Amsterdam East? So I wrote a letter, I'm always starting with that. I wrote a letter to the mayor of Amsterdam and said like, well, when there are children are born, um, all uh, the family is coming, uh, bring presents. And I don't know how you call that in English, but it's like the first visit to celebrate the baby. And then the baby uh, will become part of that family and that um, community around it. And I said, we have like so like 12 neighborhoods and nobody ever went there to celebrate and make them a part of the city of Amsterdam. On a day they were there, but they are never shown to international guests. So what will that neighborhood feel, you know, when there are, when there are important guests coming and we only stay in that fucking little, little city center? So from... So, and of course I got a, a letter back, which was saying like nothing and, <laughs> you know. Too, and bad. That, Too bad, we're still gonna stay in the city. <laughs> yeah, and from that idea, I thought of, okay, I, I take the, the what, what Amsterdam is calling the most, um, let's say the, the, the highest crim, 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 criminal numbers and the most poor neighborhood and like, very far away, you know, like nobody dares to go there, da di da di da. And that is how I, that is Slotermeer. And this is Slotermeer. So I. But how did you meet the people in those neighborhoods, please? Like, literally, we go with, I go with my research team on the bike. We go there or we go with the tram and then we say, okay, you take that street, I take that street and at the end of the day, we meet. And then you start uh, ringing bells. <laughs> Did anybody close the door on your face? Yeah. Yeah, which is actually uh, nice. Exactly. <laughs> which is very nice because the first time you you because then you start to study uh, that is the beauty of of being mirrored because because of your fear and your shock you run to your bike that is what i did then i was at my bike and then i thought yeah well it was just a no let's try again you know, and at the third time, the man said, rah, 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 rah. well, okay, come in. <laughs> you know, like that. So it's so, and also a no, which stays a no, is like beautiful. Right. So, so then I, I, I throw a postcard uh, in the mailbox to thank them for saying no, which is like a dialogue. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is so beautiful of this whole, so that is, yeah, th this whole structure. So then I asked, I asked all my actors, which are 10, because the, the, the performance itself uh, takes five hours. And as a public, you go from one house to the other, but you see in that performance as a public, you see only two houses. So you see two big scenes of an hour in two houses. So you could go to, the, to, to this show like five times because it's five times a different route you follow. And the actors are living for two weeks in the houses of um, the local citizens 
become part of their family or the household. Um, and from that, what I call uh, that, it's, it's a kind of love crash. Can you say crash? Yeah, it's a kind of love crash. You know, it's two life scenarios who are, you know, like also start to. Did you say love as in love crash? Yeah. Okay. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah, For yeah. you, everything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's possible if you think it's possible. <laughs> in, the, in, in the love press. And then... Um, Were after there, hang on, pause. Pause, pause. Were there any non-love crashes in these, in these occupations? In the no, adoption? Yeah, you have you have moments or sometimes days of uh, the two are not understanding each other or get irritated. But I visit uh, together with my team, with my artistic team. Uh, we visit them very shortly every day. So uh, we, when there is like a a complication or the dialogue is not smooth or irritation, uh, then we open that up in a dialogue and we talk what's going on or what is the judgmental stuff in your brain and what is your protection uh, to keep very pure in the moment uh, with the other. And I did it, I did this huge thing seven times, also two times in Mexico, one in a criminal area in the middle uh, of Mexico City in the, in the neighborhood Tepito. And I did one in Juarez. Which unbelievable. Juarez in the neighborhood of the uh, feminicidios, the women killing, uh, that is next to the American city, help me. Uh, the San Antonio? San Diego? San Diego, what's on the other side of Juarez? I don't even know, I'm Canadian. Hold on. Um, oh my God, how can I forget? Juarez. Um, hang on. El Paso. Yeah. So the performances take place also in the houses of the people and you have the material comes out of interviews with the family and you structure it or is it improvised? No, they, they, they prefer, it comes out of the occupation of actors in those houses. Yeah, but how does it, wh what do people see? Yeah, what frankly, what I do is, no, I don't interview the family. I interview like in, like also when you make theater uh, through improvisation. So for example, Frank, you are the local citizen and yeah. I'm an actor, yeah. then somebody else, of our team is interviewing us uh, about our relationship of the two weeks I lived with you. Yeah. And we make a text out of that interview. So we learn the text together and we play it together. And mm -hmm. does, the, does the actor and the citizen adjust the text? Yeah. They, okay. Yeah. So they participate critically in the development of the text? Yeah. Great. Completely. Great. And first I make, first I direct the scene with the written text, um, how we made it, how we wrote it. And after a week of playing, they are free to improvise with the text. But first, I, I really, as a director, I really want them to know and to be very sure what is the dramaturgy, uh, what is, uh, you know, the, yeah, what is the story, uh, on which moment, where is the aggression, where's the shadow side, where's the bump, you know, every, where's the tenderness, so that they really know how to play it, and then they can... Mm. And the was, 
go ahead, Frank. Sorry, honey. The community was like a Muslim family, or there were families from. Uh, so what, what 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 give us an idea? How do you select them? Just is it because people live there on that street they happen to, or do you have a theme? Uh, no, no, I don't have a theme. It's it's the area. Uh, it's two kilometers by two kilometers. That's the area where we play in. Also, uh, all churches who are in that area, uh, we ask to open up. Uh, so that uh, when people walk from one house to the other, so they so that are the scenes in, in, in the houses, that's for one hour. But also you see little scenes on your way through the uh, area. Natural scenes or staged no, that's scenes. All, no, that's all directed. Okay. Uh, and sometimes it is like, uh, an open text, for example, of, well, the, for example, uh, in that first show, there was a, a Muslim mother which said, I can do it. I can do this performance or I can do this show. But at four o'clock, I have to pick up my girl from school. So I made that shape, picking up the girl from the school, I made it part of the performance. Mm. And then I ask the teacher, for example, to talk to the public uh, for like three minutes, and also, and I also rehearse with her to tell about what is like uh, what is special about this school. Or but Frank, is there is a, there is, a, or correct me if I'm wrong, Adelheid. It's not just a random. It's not like oh, I'm going to go to this two kilometers and do it here. There's an idea behind why that two kilometers. So the first one had to do with bringing citizens, bringing people from Amsterdam to neighborhoods they don't normally go to. Right. Because, you know, because the mayor wouldn't bring his people there. So fuck the mayor. I'm going to bring people there. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first one. The one you did in, in Juarez, was in a was chosen by the artistic director no no it was chosen with, uh, um, by my mexican partner that's what i thought yeah yeah can you tell so he chose to do it in a particular neighborhood in that was uh where there were a lot of killings in juarez please say what this neighborhood was again that was about the, it's what, what is called the feminicidios, and that is the, the killing that was like worldwide in the, in, the, um, in the rank of one, two, three, where women were killed in one city. So it is a particular, there's something that uh, to be explored. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and that is, Frank, you were right about the theme. So Juarez, for example, was about the theme. And the last uh, I did in, in, in Holland was in the city of Utrecht that was in asylum center. That was for the first time that I worked together with, an or with like an organization, like a building with refugees. And that was for me like new because then I wanted to, so all the actors were living in the asylum center which was a huge do job to get that done, <laughs> you totally. know, on forehand. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Do you feel, Adelheid, that, that what you invented or what you found, this method of working, is that something in that COVID time we live in where we rethink our theaters? Every theater in the world is thinking, what are we doing? Um, is it something that could work as a practical solution also for small work, but also do you think is that what every theater should be doing? During COVID, you mean? Is that, yeah, during the time where we don't have, cannot play in big houses, you know? So what you did there in small performances in, in apartments is a possibility as a form. Do, do you think, uh, are you thinking about doing this in the time and now of that virus and COVID as performances? Yeah, because that, that, that's, that's very nice that you are coming up with this because Ola Mafalani, she's a director 
originally from Syria. And she's a friend of mine. And she said to me two weeks ago, I didn't think of it yet, actually, but you did and she did. <laughs> and she said like, uh, hey, you actually, Adelaide, you have a, a COVID um, proof performance already there. This, this grid, this blueprint, this structure. Um, but it wouldn't be here. It wouldn't be a natural structure for here. People would be way too afraid. Who knows? How many people come to the apartment, to the show? Uh, there, uh, the maximum is 120 per day. Oh, so you have different, but how many come in at the same time? Five people or? 10 people or? Uh, well, that is, uh, we have uh, 12 in, 20, in 10 houses. And then we also have 12 um, guy, uh, young boys from the street. Uh, sometimes also um, uh, the, crimin the criminal ones who walk with, a, I don't know how you call that. We have uh, something around your ankle. Ankle, yeah, yeah. Electro, if it's an electronic uh, cuff or whatever. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I like them very, very much. <laughs> and yeah, they are wonderful guys, uh, and they are, uh, and they are also very happy because they have also debts. Do you say debts? Or they have to pay money because debt, debt. just think debt. DPT, yeah. That and so when they work in the performance, they can pay that back. Uh, and they drive the public. So I make beautiful choreographies with them because they have to drive five hours. You know, they work they working very hard. So they pick up uh, public here and they bring it to there and they pick up there and they bring it to here and they drive like crazy. And that is also something I love that the public is uh, in the first instance a bit shocked, you know, because they see like it's, it's, it's also a sound. They, they drive with 12 and they enter the street and then they line up. And then the public in Holland was, the, was the also the first time very honest because they said, oh, I was so judgmental. I grabbed my my bag, I grabbed my phone. I thought like, oh, this beautiful performance. I'm in, in a neighborhood and now there they are. They're gonna kill me. <laughs> and then they were so gentle and sweet. And in, 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 in Juarez, uh, Daniel Jimenez Cacho, remember this name, the Mexican actor and director, Daniel Jimenez Cacho. Sometimes you have like miracles, and that is also why, why I will be grateful to Gideon for meeting you. You know that you meet someone who feels like soul family, and you cannot imagine it's true. That what happened between us, that also happened with Daniel in Mexico. I did a workshop. I gave the workshop about this show. Uh, and he was translating me and I and I do not speak yeah I, 25 words Spanish but the whole flow of the man so after an hour of teaching I was teaching and he was translating I said to him man you know like whispering very quickly man you're my brother how do you know me so well it's a, you know I felt it and with him I had this beautiful co-producer, this beautiful man who, you know, was in, in, we were together, the artistic team, and on a day he said also, I, he's so funny, he's so intelligent and so funny, and he was grabbing on his, okay, he says, Adelaide, today will be the day, today we go to the motorcycles, because I know you need 12 motor guys to drive the public. And I only know a criminal group, but that's in Mexico, something different than in Holland. So prepare lady. And he took me there. He took me everywhere. 
And they did. So I had for the first time as an artist conversations with the head of that criminal group. And then I started to deal, you know, it was really dealing. Also with the, with the father, that was also so beautiful. A handicapped son of a mafia um, father wanted to be part of the performance. And the father uh, was uh, handling drugs. And that was in his house because the guy was handicapped and he was in the bed and sometimes in a wheelchair and the public uh, uh, was, uh, so the fa we had to, the dialogue with the father and we had to reschedule our performance because the, the father was saying, wah, 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 yeah. well, uh, between 11 and uh, 1.30, I do business here on the, you know, on the, on the, on the street walk or on the sidewalk. So nobody after that. Yeah. After two. Yeah. Yeah. You got more. You can come. So, <laughs> and I, and I, we, I had to make a deal with, that was one moment I really shivered that I, I made also with those guys, but they were older and they were driving on, yeah, on, on, bikes they were like huge motor bikes um i was working uh and trying to make the lineup so sometimes you are shouting no because it's like they are very far away and sometimes they are joking or not hearing me and i had to make the lines up for the the motor so, so i was like guys listen da, 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 you know like how you direct yeah and then on a certain moment, one guy came up to me, the boss. <laughs> Having that slow, I was like, oh, no, Daniel in the neighborhood. I was like, oh my God. And he was complaining about my behavior, you know, about raising my voice. Uh, and, of and then I thought, oh man, of course, that is like, uh, he's like the chief and he has to stay the chief. Um, so I said, okay, um, can we do uh, one, let's make one, uh, you say not appointment, but one rule between us. So I'm, you tell me every time, so you may really be strict or shout back. So when I, when I enter your territory, when, when, where, there, where I enter your how do you say that? Yeah, territory. Territory is okay. Uh, territory is fine. Yeah, then you, you have a code word for me. And then I use that same code word for you. So you are the chief of the territory of the motorcycles and I am the chief of the art. Because we have to work together. So we both have our territories. And he went, mm. Agreed. And then he walked back. <laughs> but it Daniel... Like, it sounds like I think Joe Papp, when he did his first Shakespeare in the Park performances, had to negotiate with gangs who were holding the territory in the parks and actually gave them jobs as, you know, people who were ushers or for security. And it helped to change something. So there is a... And now the Central Park, of course, you know, looks so, so very different. It was the very very beginning of a turnaround next to these five women who said we have to change New York um, City parks. Um, so Adelheid, um, what, what do you believe that your theater can do? What, what your art, your intervention, from your experience of 30 years, what did it do? What happened? And what do you think it can do? It's what you said yesterday. What did I say, sweetheart? You said you give people space to have their voice. Yeah. Um, on a very late moment in my life, I understood the metaphor of the fairy tale of, is it? Cinderella, who goes to the 
to the bowl. And the other one is called Doorn Roosje with the Sleeping Beauty. The Sleeping Beauty. That somebody is kissing you awake or pushing you. It's like the apple, you know, the prince is pushing uh, the coven where she's in. And then blah, your, blah, your breath is coming back. And he's kissing her awake. And I think in every human being, there is such a beauty. There's such a grace. There's such a tenderness. And when we keep on going on with all that rules and not being living on one schoolyard and we are pushing people aside, then it's like the start of eating that apple. And on a certain moment, it's frozen. And on a certain moment, you're maybe still alive, but uh, you cannot breathe well, you, you shiver, you, you are neglected, you are, feel, you, you, you experience yourself as 10% of your vital being. And I think my work is uh, what I mentioned many times in interviews, it's like kissing awake. We kiss awake each other. Or we are awakening each other with a kiss. The whole adoption method is about that. The whole artwork is about <laughs> oh, the apple is out and the, the and giving the voice back. And then at once I see citizens and citizens only with beautiful, talented beings. Not so difficult to see, actually beautiful, strong persons who are like only because they are called minor people or whatever they are called. It's to cry, it's really to cry. It's incredible that we live that way. <laughs> I have it every time. I, it's like, we have this. <laughs> you know, we have this, we could make this. And we cannot see the beauty of another person. You cannot accept another person on that schoolyard. You want to make your own schoolyard. Mm -hmm. You even want to call it a, a not human being. You even want to skip it out of the race of being human. For me, it, it's, uh, I, well, <laughs> I made a performance with it. That was also like a, I made a performance with my old teacher. He's also an actor and he get, he's a writer also and he, um, he was his, he was for me teacher in art school uh, uh, writing songs. George is his name. George. He was married for forty five years. Um, after his after Unc, also a friend of mine, died, there was this beautiful process in George, really tender process that he also connected with the love in his heart for boys. And then he started and he was like 72, 70 or 72. And he started to call or by internet making appointments with uh, the escort service and inviting boys at his, at his house, at his house. 
for me, that was like, I tell it so slowly. <laughs> I had to do that in Holland too. I tell it so slowly because I was amazed by the beauty of it. I was amazed by, I, I knew Schorsch for so long. I knew his love for Ank. I know them, I knew them together so long. And then that a life is in transition and that Schorsch was for me like such an adult spirit that he could step into this new landscape. And then I said to him, and that is Melanie and Frank, how it goes. I was drinking coffee with him. And then after this story, I, I, I said to Shores, okay, you are receiving a visit every week that's new in your life. In, the, in that same period, I went to my mother every week to pay her a visit because she had Alzheimer and lived in an, how do you say that, in a care home, elderly. It's fine. And then I said to Shores, let's start rehearsing. Because this is the change of my life and this is the change in your life. Mm. Yeah, for sure you mean you're like young men because boys, you know, of course, is, is a different age. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, young man, yeah, young man. Um, but yeah, so it is really to open up, to, to, to see reality, how it is, to find truth. And Melanie, we're becoming closer to the end. What do you see in the theater of Adelheid? Where you say, this is a solution, this is a form. This is something we have to take very serious because it's radically different. Going at uh, someone's door, ringing the doorbell, say, can I live with you? Can I make a show? Can I make a, depending on dialogue that happens between you and the others. It's the most opposite of a revival of a Broadway musical you can think about, you know? So, so, but, so what do you see in her work and what do you think can, can be learned from it? Well, fuck, what a question. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, you know, I don't really think very much about, I don't believe in models, like for one person to invent a model and another person to use that model, I, especially as an artist. I, I'm always, um, I don't believe in model, modeling um, artistic projects or People are gonna steal from each other anyway. <laughs> um, that's normal. But um, what I see, I guess, is permission. Is the sort of endless stream of invitation to, to do what you think can't be done. But you have like, I, and I also think, I mean, you, you, you're probably going to hate this. Yeah, tell me, tell me. No, Frank is not going to love this, maybe. Oh. But I think it's also um, leading your process with love. Um, I actually think I'm at my best when I lead with love. Um, I'm at my worst when I've forgotten that that's what's leading. Um, my my work in any event. And I think that holding on to that is a difficult thing. It, it, there are many things, there are many fears, there are, you know, there are many things that put a, you know, that make a glottal stop in that stream. And um, I feel if anything can be learned from Adelheid's work, it's to continue to begin with this, with love. When she says, I, I think my work is a kissing awake. She is, you know, like right there. That's what I mean. Like mm -hmm. she kisses people awake. She doesn't shake them awake. 
much, you know. Um, and so I think that, and I feel that in my body. I feel that, or I, I don't know whether it comes from me or from her or from, I don't know where it comes from, but I feel it. And uh, I feel inspired when I talk to her and other friends, other pe a handful, a very few handful of other people I know that that is, um, and it's not just love for the theater. It's not love of theater or making theater. That's normal. I mean, love of the of other. And how does that generate your work? And how does that generate your ideas? And how does that generate your career as an artist? And so, I mean, I, I feel to cry to say this mm. because, um, well, yeah, I feel it, it, this time is so difficult you know, um, and complicated and frightening and um, chaotic and unknown. And, and so to be able to, you know, when John Lewis died, I got really quiet because I thought that's a person who led with love from who trained himself to do so from the time he was 17. And I, I want to be able to do that. And I feel sometimes quite challenged to keep that continuing. So that's why I feel to cry sometimes. But um, I guess, I mean, I, it's even how I closed the book, you know, like I didn't know how to end the Foundry book. Okay, like, are you kidding? First of all, how can I even explain that I ended the Foundry? You know, like that alone, is, you know, I mean, I don't know forever if I'll be able to fully make the words that, that articulate that. But the only thing I could say as a, as a close to the book is that everything we did in some way was led by love. And I think that everyone who would ever worked at the Foundry would probably say, oh yeah, okay, maybe. You know, at the but I don't think everyone would anyone would say no way. So, yeah. So I feel that I feel like that. Uh, if anything can be learned, it's somebody's capacity to hold that love spigot open, even when that scary drug lord is coming toward you. For the first thought to be, oh, of course you're angry, as opposed to going to the fear place. That's a creative gesture to me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That, that, that lends itself to creativity and doesn't stop it. Yeah, but that, so, was, actually, but that was actually also the space uh, where I met you in. Uh, I, I really met you in the, because you are for me like an older sister, you know, you are the senior in this. And when, hey, I'm not too senior. <laughs> no, but I, no, but that, but yeah, but <laughs> no, I know, I know. <laughs> no, but I mean, no, but I mean it from my heart. It was like you were like an old Indian. So actually, yeah, you were like an Indian. Native uh, American, you mean Native American, you mean, or Indian? Uh, yeah. You mean an indigenous person? Or yeah. Okay. What? Yeah. Yeah, you were, you were, and you, you were, you, you, you were, you were saying in, in, in the beginning of this session, you, you, you were saying like, I, maybe I was a bit, grumpy and da, 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 da. but actually that was my fascination right away. The fascination was your strength. The fascination was your autonomy of to be, uh, well, I don't know. For me, that was a, um, a yeah, for me, that's beauty. <laughs> really, I mean it. Okay. I mean it. Okay. Mm. So okay. 
I mean, so that comes to me, but I wanna, let's stay with the work. Don't, 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 you know, let's stay on the work, please. So I think that- um, um, You have to take this compliment. I, I know it's difficult. Okay. That's part of the life work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, thank on. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I think, Frank, what I feel I wish I, there's so many things that I wish I could talk to the whole world about today. Like the whole world. I wish, I've always said this, I wish I could have a conversation with the whole entire world about how we make this world, you know? And, um, and I think that these are, these are really, I love, was it, who, who spoke from F Spider Woman? Uh, it was uh, Miguel and, um, and her sister, both of them. So whoever said that we are in a creation myth, I couldn't agree more. I feel really inspired by thinking of that. And so I think that how we think about theater, I mean, I guess for me in a certain way, it's how do we think about love first? And how do we think about... Um, how do we think about relations first? And how, especially in this country now, okay? And how do we think about, how are we approaching, um, how are we approaching the change that's been asked of us in, in, in you know, how, because it, for me, that's how you know what theater to make, not what we're going to do during COVID not what theater we're going to do during COVID, but what questions, what wondering we can present and, and, and offer each other during COVID. And I think the one serious question is how are we going, you know, we haven't, I'm very concerned about what's to come financially because we've had help up to, you know, we've had help where in lots of countries that doesn't happen. So we've had some help and I think we don't even have any idea how scary it's going to be financially in the coming year. And so I do think we have to start thinking about how to be practical with how to make a living and how to pay the rent and how to send our kids to school and how to buy the groceries. And I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily going to be from theater. And which doesn't mean theater is dying. Theater will always rebound. If we didn't do it for a year or a year and a half, it's not gonna kill the theater. But what we do have to, I think, to figure out is how we're going to live. You know, like, how are we going to, how are we going to financially live? And um, so I think we could all get jobs. Like what are the jobs we could do in the meantime while we make things on Zoom, while we write the next projects, while we, while we, while we. So I am, I know a lot of my colleagues and I think it's also easier for me to say because I retired the foundry and so I'm in a position of thinking what is theater in a whole new way and how am I and how am I enlivened in it, to it, for it? Do you know, what is the next incarnation of my body in that space? So I was already there, you know, so it sort of, I was already prepared in a certain way to think about, okay, what's next? Or not even, what's coming? What's coming for me in, in the theater? What would I want to go see? What would I want to make? What would I want to invite people to? So I also think I'll say one more thing. This creation myth time is so full. I mean, let's think about it right now. I mean, in this country, we have COVID. We have black, we have the- uh, Black Lives the, Matter? Yes. We have- Me uh, too. Well, we had Me Too already, but I'm, that was already present and had its crest uh, about a year ago. But still, right now, the crests are the COVID, and we have an election coming up. Oh, yeah. Maybe the most important election in the history of the United States of America. 
Okay, so these are huge, huge tidal waves of consideration. So how we make theater, the subject matter of our theater, we don't even fucking know where our feet are gonna walk tomorrow. You know, so thinking about what we make, what is consequential in the subject matter of what we make, I'm cross-eyed. Every time I sit down to write, apart from the fact that I have like really bad COVID brain, so I can't really focus, but every time I sit down to write, even for a small bit of time, I think I'm not ready to speak about this yet. I'm not ready even to ask these questions. I don't even know what the fucking question is. You know, so I, that's why I think what you're doing, Frank, is so fucking important because it is the way to keep all of us <laughs> available to each other in this moment, as opposed to, okay, this is how we're gonna make theater for the next six months. And this is how, and many people are thinking about this and there's lots of theater online and there's, there's lots of things. And I think everybody has to worry about how they're not gonna lose their audience. And look, I made theater for 25 years. I never had a season, I never had a subscription and I always had an audience. So, you know, and you never know when I was gonna do a piece, but people came. You know, it was always a, you know, a miracle, but they freaking came. So, and there were years where I didn't do a play at all in New York City. And still, then the next year I did something and they came. Yeah. So I think that this terror of how are we going to keep our audience engaged? I'm not really down for that. They'll, you know, I think if you put stuff up and they want to, I don't know. We don't know what the theater is going to do next or what it's going to be about. And I only, I say the atheist prayer. You know what the atheist prayer is, Frank? Okay. The atheist prayer is this. Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. <laughs> So I say the atheist prayer fairly regularly that we can be, that we can fill ourselves with love. Mm. Even in the rage of this moment, it's hard, but I think it's the only thing that will lead creativity in a way that we We, we can add something to making the world. You know? Yeah, no, I hear you. Absolutely, beautiful said. What do you want to be happening, Frank? What do you want to be happening in, th what, or what have you heard is happening in COVID that you think holds a theatrical rhythm in this meantime time? Because you've interviewed so many people. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's uh, week 17 um, times five, you know, that's a- uh, uh, I hope you can take some time off, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, like what have you heard as like, Oh, that's great that that's happening. I'm so glad that's happening. I mean, the fundamental thing is, in a way, also, what do you say? I think that people question, what am I doing? People really, everybody, we always did before, but there's something different. There's a different quality of um, questioning. There's a different quality of seriousness. There's a different quality of um, urgency, I think. And it's also about our lives. People understand we are in the way we are animals, we can die. We all, all know it, but now we really can with the wrong handshake. I mean, that's what our Tyler Max said, you know, my friends survived AIDS and now a handshake killed them. A friend of him died. So, you know, um, we do not know. Uh, 14, 15 times more might be infected than we know. 50 million people it would be in the US. And uh, it's uh, also becoming obvious that perhaps a vaccination might not be good enough. You people lose uh, immunity, it looks like. It might, we don't know what will happen. And uh, we really don't. 
And so we have to think what's essential. And I think Melanie's uh, thought that what is the love is, um, in a way, love is the answer. You know, love is just something that uh, we have to think about for ourselves, ourselves. We have to change, authentic change. Saying this is what I hear through from many, many, say, like Carl Hancock, Rock said, if we don't change now, if we don't make changes in our lives, in our communities, in our cities, in our countries, what did all these people die for? You know, what, why did this all happen? And, um, and, uh, and so I think uh, um, why theater is so beautiful and great, it does reflect what's going on and what people think about. So there will be uh, uh, modifications, changes, new forms, and uh, perhaps that's not the uh, important thing because it always has done that. But I think what is important is that theater in itself as a very ancient art that came before movies, came before TV, it's the originalist Carl also said, you know, so that it has a magical power as Adelheid said, or what you say, you know, that to heal us, to connect us. And that creational myth the spider woman talked about. Yeah, we could say there is a country, there is the plague, it has a mad king. People have not enough to eat. Yeah, how many stories do we know? They were told like this, but there were stories. But now we're in it. And but what we do is important, it's of significance, and those stories we heard have some meaning. And uh, I know there's a, perhaps the big change is uh, in our world also that, uh, you know, the famous David Byrne song, Stop Making Sense. Uh, now, perhaps it is time uh, to start making sense. Jenny Bass, that great musician from that band, band, The Savages, her radio program is called Stop Making Sense, you know, on Apple Music, where she said, no, we have to make sense. And we have to create meaning. We have to, you know, include the atheist prayer because that's what we do. And I think, uh, um, yes, I think what I hear, it is, that's why Adelheid's word is important, include communities to you know, represent the world as it is, and perhaps call people to action. It's about your life, about the audience. It's no longer about the master artist that he's so great and shines, you know, so that perhaps artists take themselves out a little bit like Adelheid does. Okay, I'm more, I'm more the traffic cop. You come here, cops come here, you come here, you do this. It is important. Um, that uh, people's life change, remedy protocols work, the excerpts, the, the exports of every day, they are of importance. And if this reflects a new world that people are in this center, what they think they experience. Heiner Müller was a great German playwright, said he realized one day, I wrote all these kind of Brecht plays about the social realism in our East Germany, but everybody in the audience knew more than us. We were just theater. Oh, people. wow. We were theater people in the dark rooms and we wanted to make our career. Totally, totally, <laughs> totally, totally. They knew more. What, what, were, what were we trying to say them? And I then, mean, I know, you know, oh my God, I know. And I also think, you know, I think it's so interesting. May I say yeah. something? Hmm? I think it's so divine what you're saying in a certain way right now, because I think that the other thing that is it is being included in the kind of decentering of the great artist is also a change in the whole idea of great leaders, one leader, one person, you know, like, you know, I was committed to shared leadership for the foundry's life and I failed and failed and failed, but that's okay. I failed upwards. You know what I mean? Because, and one of the main reasons I closed down the foundry is because I was the only one leading it and I knew that was wrong for what it was, Do you know? Because I could feel, and I really can feel now, the shared leader, I mean, their shared leadership is proliferating a little bit around the theater now. But I think the whole idea of leadership slash power is in question now. Yeah. yeah, and it's related to artists descent. You know, the ego of the artist not not being murdered, but decentering itself without losing its creative inhibition. Do you know what I mean? And oh my goodness, you know, I have to say one of the greatest things that happened to me in the life of the foundry was when we were. Do you know, it was always trying to bring artists and social justice communities together. And there was, there's so much 
in those particular two communities, there's a lot of disconnect in language and understanding of what one another does. There's not animosity, but disconnect. And um, so when we, when we were doing Fury and Pins and Needles, we rehearsed for nine months with this community, with Fury. And one of the members of Fury, her name is Cynthia Butts. I'm still really good friends with her now. Um, she said, when we were having a meeting with all the whole company, she said, I don't think any of us knew until now that making art is really hard. And can I tell you guys, I thought I could have died and gone to heaven at that moment, just to be recognized, mm -hmm. not personally, but the practice of art making as something difficult and rigorous by people who who are not so sure that what we do matters. Do you know what I mean? It, to For them to have been engaged in the practice of it and be able to look at us and say, you're not a bunch of fairy queens dancing, or, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. That To me, that was like one of the great triumphs. Yeah. You know? And on top of it, it was a great show. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen as the great, one of the great things I've seen in New York. I also happened to sit next to Harry Belafonte when I saw it, by the way, but- Oh, um, wow. Wow. <laughs> that, you know, musical idea that came out of a writing workshop in a union and someone had a great reception, even a Broadway run, I think in the thirties to research yep. the beauty of it, the respect and also the simplicity of it. And, uh, but the hard, hard, hard work that was behind it, yeah, it was an uh, incredible. Um, uh, I loved that show. Yeah. I loved that show so much. I, I couldn't get enough of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I think, yeah, we are really um, uh, in a time where, where we have to think of what to do and to put, uh, connect to the people as same way, perhaps, as politicians just see people as voters uh, and, uh, uh, commercial companies, see people as customers to buy things, maybe also in theater, we just said, oh, they are ticket holders or ticket buyers. And we, and in a way to say what Adelheid said, you know, see a person, they are people. These are people. Yeah. And, um, and uh, Hans Hake, the German artist, and I saw that at the new museum, he, for one of his projects, he traced people who came to the opening of his show in New York and said, where do you live? and wrote it down and then he went around and took photos and then he made a f art wall you know say where do they all come from but how do they are in the very beginning in a way had their lives you know they they were the ones who came to my show you know so that idea that saying, <laughs> I'm your life you know so it's a radical uh, thing in one of the many models as melanie of course pointed out and solutions but i think uh, idol had really um, found something that, by the way, next, that it's also a great model one can think about and modify. And they're always disruptive inventions. One could say like the iPhone was a disruptive invention and then the Google phone adapted it. Or maybe Adelheid made it a disruptive one and but you can adopt it. That's also, that's great and fine. So, but, um, but it is a, you know, a time to, you know, really honor that new way. And if theater represents that now people are in the center of it, that's a good thing. If yeah. this if philosophically, this the emancipated spectator, what Rancière are we going to have on Monday? What he well, wrote. That's it. exciting. You're going to have Rancière on, the, on Monday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, uh, we just did a sound check today with him. And to say, you know, this is something, do we, don't we really think a little bit, we know a little bit better in the theater than the person? Don't we really also think we are a bit better at, okay, we know something more? And he said, no. That's his great book on the uh, uh, schoolmaster who doesn't know more than the, 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 the pupil. He said, you know, so much wrong in the world comes if we think we are better than someone else. This is the root of a lot of evil, as Adelheid said uh, on the school year. So yeah, you don't belong here. You know, no, everybody belongs. And that great or mayor yeah. of Palermo who was on our show, he said, people ask him, how many foreigners and immigrants do you have? How many foreigners do you have in Palermo? And he says, none. And people say, what do you mean? And 
all the people coming in. Rabbi Yosef. He says, not everybody who is in Palermo is part of the city. I don't know what your question implies. You know, he was the one who went on a boat. He, uh, the Salvini, the prime minister of Italy said, no money gets in more on, into Italy. So he went to his office, photocopied invitations from his city, went on a refugee boat, gave everybody uh, the permission to come in. And, they, and the Italian prime minister said, I'm gonna send the military to Palermo, I'm going to siege, do the siege on the city. And he said, okay, do it. Fine with me, put me to jail, you know? So, and he's the guy who said, I saw Pina Bausch's play on Palermo. I don't know if you know, where a wall came down. He said, this was the most beautiful thing in my life. I understood art is important. They are opening theaters. They are, you know, uh, uh, revitalizing uh, There's something on that island which we hadn't done, they connect. And he says, our place is a theater in itself. There's, there's a theater of a city of a theater and a theater of the city is of significance. So things are taking change. And, um, and I think this is something we have to keep in mind beyond the idea, yes, it's good for the economy and this. And I said, no, theater is something much more significant and deep and ancient. It will always be there, it will come back, but hopefully we find a re-engagement. If we don't do it as artists, who else will? You know, we don't find new forms, meaningful forms where else we have to uh, engage. And that's why it is important to really, really think is why I am interested to hear from, from the artists. And it's still, as Melanie said, a moment of confusion and there are no recipes, but everybody is reflecting deeply and is reflecting seriously and is, says, yes, this is our lives. Maybe we're wrong before. If you all day almost all of a sudden confronted with your mortality, which we always are, but we say, if one day I die, no, we are gonna die, we know that. It's clear, you know, so this has become uh, something changed and I hope um, that, um, yeah, we will also find ways in New York that we have a theater for the city and the city is connected to theater because it celebrates life, we enjoy life, there's joy in it and love and um, that we communicate that right. Yeah. I love you, Frank. Thank you so much for doing this. No, that's important. How great it is to hear from Adelheid uh, to, about her work. Yeah, in a way, you don't talk in, in a way of a show when you have to sell it or you're an opening or the interview was really cut down to really say, why does she do it? What's, you know, what's keeping her motor running? You know, we know a little bit more and, uh, and it can inspire us. Or Melanie, your, your, your work and what you did over decades uh, in New York and failed and tried again and did beautiful things and always looking and connecting uh, people. Yeah. I'm thinking a little bit of time of war, a tiny bit, not a lot, a couple of minutes, I guess. But uh, no, no, Wait, no. Wait, Adelheid is trying to say something. Yeah, say something. Yeah, maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe, um, maybe, I do not want to make you shy, Frank, as I didn't want to make Melanie shy um, minutes ago. But the it is what Melanie is saying. It is very, very important what you are doing. And uh, what I maybe do in my work and what I feel also shy now to do with you is like, um, let's take a moment for you in the center. Well, we'll... Uh, we'll, we'll uh, we actually want that because, you know, just even in what you just went through, just to quote all of the people you've spoken to, studied, know about. To me, that's like, I can't get enough of that. <laughs> but also, and but also it feels like maybe that's in the first instance, uh, that's the same with the local citizens or the adoption. In the first instance, it feels uncomfortable. And mm. we jump over it. Mm. And the thing is, like, the real connection between the actors and the citizens and the locals and everybody and also the public 
is to to really uh, my heart is inviting you uh, to repeat the beautiful words of Melanie to you. It's like um, come near. Because you did it, because you facilitated it. And you did it five times a week. I even didn't know. For 17 weeks. Yeah. Well, thank you. It really means a lot to me. Yes, it is. As Melanie would say, it's a lot of work. There was a great German comedian, Karl Valentin, at the time of life. He would say, art is beautiful, but it's a lot of work, he said. <laughs> It was kind of a simple. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh my God, it's so much work. It's, oh my God. it's a lot of work. And, uh, Plus, you know, we also have to thank you and HowlRound because this shit yeah. is free to watch. Yeah. We're never going to have to pay for it. We're yeah. never, you know, all of the, I've visited so many of the, thank God it's there because I couldn't be with you at noon so I can go and see Carl Hancock Rux's talk. I can go, I've been to visit, I visited so many of the talks that people have done and it feels so much of a relief in a certain way to find other sisters and brothers in this moment. Do you know what I mean? And it's an incredible library of this moment. Yeah. Uh, and thank you. It's one, yeah, well, that's wonderful. Yes. Thank you both for contributing it and making it uh, um, what it is. I see myself also a little bit as a as a, a Melanie or as Adelheid, a tra kind of a traffic cop. Yes, here you come, two, 12, next. No, two months, we can't. I need someone, someone can't. But that's how it is. And that's how it is, as you all say. And um, It's not glamorous, Frank. <laughs> I think uh, moments also like this really make it make it make it worth it. What Adelheid as a closing statement, and I think Melanie already gave a very very serious one. But what do you think? What do you say to young artists? What do you say to the young Adelheid Rosen who might just come out of art school after those four years and COVID would happen? And what, what do what do we keep in mind? And also Melanie, if you of course say something good. Uh, what is of essence? What what should we be thinking about? Um, uh, let the distance be your uh, nearest friend. Because what we have to do to, uh, now is uh, um, the distance is you cannot shake hands, but shake hands is also the thing you are used to. Now in the distance, you have to honor with your eyes. So you really have to take moments on the street uh, when you walk. Uh, and I already gave my class, so that are young actors, um, to make like uh, 25 very small performances about come near, just come to me as one sentence in the life uh, on a distance with somebody you do not know in the street and make a very small artwork of that meeting. So in September, when I start teaching, every, every student will have 25 very small artworks, which is a reflection in a form they may choose themselves. Um, but really take that long moment of inviting. And to do that with your eyes and your breath is much more tender than where we are used to with this or even with this. So take that distance as intimacy. Make of the distance a new intimacy. Oh, what a great idea. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah.
I guess what I would say to the kids is that they have a world to make. Mm. You know, and they, and I can't wait to follow them into this new world. I can't wait to see what they're going to make Beautiful. of this crazy fucking time that we're in. I can't wait to hear how they interpret the possibility of, I, I, how they interpret the changes that are going to be made. It's not even they must be made. They are already being made. It's an organic part of the energetics of this time change is going to happen. It isn't to say that there won't be all kinds of fascist resistance to it and all kinds of ways that are gonna try to kill it, but you can't kill life. You can't <laughs> kill the, You can't kill life that you don't know how to recognize. And those fascists don't know what this is. Like that woman doesn't see your show and goes on TV and says what a threat it is. That's okay. It's good she didn't come and see the show. You could keep making it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let the TV do whatever it does. You just keep making your shows and they'll do what they do. So I can't wait to see what the, the, the next generations are going to make of this creation moment. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And uh, as someone said, uh, yeah. You can cut flowers, but spring is coming, right? So you can cut them away, but they're hopefully there's something bigger and stronger. And it has been so. Um, thank you both. This was truly a quite a, quite a conversation, and uh, between you guys, and uh, thanks for including me and having me with it, and uh, our respect to the work which you put your life in, you dedicated your life to in uh, countless hours and years and decades and decades. And I think people often do not realize how, how much really, really is behind it next to the energy and love and, uh, and time. It is also an incredible dedication and uh, relentlessness and belief, a deep, deep belief that it matters and it really it does and so really thank you and also you found ways that now perhaps are some answers to questions now everybody has you know and uh, when we can't be in the 2000 seat houses what do we do but perhaps it was never so great in the 2000 seat houses and we go back and learn something as i said next monday we have the great uh, jacques concierge who will talk to us what he feels what he said what does a philosopher really think that's exciting Someone who also is close to the arts. What does he really think about the, the time? Uh, the great Morgan Janess, and we talked about her, and she's going to come on uh, Tuesday. She worked with Joe Papp uh, very early on in the public theater. She has been part of the landscape of New York theater, supported so many artists. What does she think? What does she see? And she has been right with so many things. So this will be important. Um, Heli Minardi from Indonesia, a performance artist, will be with us and talk about the work she does, but also the community she is creating in, in Indonesia. And uh, Dima Michaela Mata from Lebanon, she will talk about her work, about creating theater in a country that at the moment is experiencing a most difficult time that's collapsing. Yeah. It's really most difficult. It survived civil wars, kind of got back, and now... And now it's collapsing, yeah. So, uh, so complicated. And to close it off, we have Richard Schechner with us who will give us a little bit of an overview again of, of what he thinks. And he prepared a special issue or in his theater magazine, the great TDR. And, um, and then I think most probably for August, li I'm listening to Melanie and I'm also listening to the artists who say, don't overproduce, don't do too much, take time to think. And if we, I don't do it, if we don't do it, how can we uh, do really do Well, and also honey, if you took, some serious time off coming back to this line of questioning will be different yeah that's true what well, a lot will happen in just everything is everything could happen on a thursday that's <laughs> yeah you know for us at universities normally it would be just a spring semester incredible what happened since march incredible yeah, yeah. so long this it's is the unbelievable i know how long this will be going on. So really, thank you. Thank you both. As Melanie said, thank you to HowlRound for hosting us. Uh, this is uh, important for VJ and Thea to be with us uh, every day. And uh, for you, the audience members, for taking the time, who in a way also are in the center 
It is about you who listens. It's really not just about Adelaide. She knows what she's doing. She doesn't need the talk in that sense. You know, of course, it's good to connect, but it's also for you to hear what she's doing. How can that be part of your life? How can you ring the doorbell of someone in your building and stay over or invite someone over as well as hosting? And be uh, in it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Transfer artistic methods as an inspiration to our own lives as a dramaturgy. How great would that be? And how much change will we? experience so um thank you for listening taking the time there is so much out there it means a lot and um and to the seagull team andy and sang yang and uh, i hope uh, some of you will turn in and you know on uh, monday and as melanie said you can always go back and listen uh, on how round uh, to that it's free it's open paj did some excerpts we might continue of 30 artists who talk they created something we might do a little book who knows but um it is really to, to be listened to. It's a live conversation. Normally interviews, people send answers up front and questions up front and uh, three hours will be condensed in a five minute uh, talk or you know, this is open, it's real. And, and it's trying to capture something and I think today we did. So thank you. And Adelheid, I took a while to get you and but I'm glad uh, we didn't give up. I think <gasps> 15 males, 16, I forget. But yeah, oh, Frank, it was horrible. I was so busy. I was so busy. I, I oh, man. Important work. And now kept on going. But things happen when they happen. So bye bye and thank you, Melanie. Thank you for joining. Thank you for being here and supporting us, but also for everything you did. Bye bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you.